Okay. I'm setting it up. First time using the live feature. Okay, we appear to be live on Facebook. So somebody just check me real quick and make sure you can see me. And if you'd like to share, um, go ahead and share. I'm gonna do this to everybody. Okay. That's a good idea. Uh -huh. Anthony Clayton, hi, good to see you. Hi, how are you? Oh my gosh, that's Sorry. Okay. All right, so we're live, um, it's 8.10, so I guess we can go ahead and get started. Um, so if you're not on the panel, I'm gonna ask you to just mute yourself. Um, so first and foremost, welcome to our talk. Um, it's called The Growing Divide. Um, I appreciate every single person that has part is participating, especially our panelists taking time out of their busy schedule. We have such dynamic people on this panel today. Um, so just a quick well, intro, um, you know, rationale for this discussion. Um, we had a lot of things happening this week, so I had to kind of remind myself why we're doing this. Um, but looking at the research, um, historically, there has been a very large gap um, between the rate in which Black men and women are obtaining higher level degrees. So bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, doctoral degrees. Um, it's a larger gap within our community than any other racial group. Um, and it's growing. And so we're seeing a lot of black women kind of going up, up and up in terms of higher education and black men are kind of either stagnant or they're kind of going down. Um, and then I started to dig a little bit because I wanted to see where that started and you know, kind of like why that started. Um, and this dates all the way back to the 70s. So this gap isn't even new. It started back in like the 1970s. Before then, in like the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, we were actually kind of on the same trajectory. So we were kind of moving up together. And then all of a sudden there was this break. Um, so it shocked me just to know how far back it goes. But when you think about what was going on at the time, and I don't want to jump ahead and start answering questions before we get into it. But when you think about the events in America that may have been impacting um, that performance rate, then it makes a lot of sense. Um, the other thing that I noticed was the gap started to close between the years of 2005 and 2015. And if you look at who was earning college degrees at that time, it was our peer group. But within the last few years, that gap has now started to widen again. Um, so I really it's really something that's dear to my heart because I don't think that anybody, one, I'm not a respectability person. I don't believe that we have to um, do anything to prove who we are, our worth, our value. But when you talk about things like representation and you talk about things um, in terms of being present and being a voice in multiple areas, that Academia is one of the areas where we're sorely underrepresented. And it's super important because academia is where the numbers come from. When policymakers, lawmakers, people that are um, building the education system, you know, making decisions for different neighborhoods and communities, and they're saying studies show this and the numbers show that, it's researchers and people in academia that are putting out those narratives and putting out those stories and helping to shape our society. And if we are underrepresented um, in those groups and in those realms, then who suffers, right? Or who's getting kind of the, the short end of the stick. So um, we want to be solution focused today. We want to talk about, you know, we also want to kind of dispel some of the stereotypes that I think we hold within our community that kind of keeps us from supporting one another and pushing forward together. 
Um, so it always seems like we're branched off in groups, black women over here, black men over there, we're doing our own things and we're kind of making assumptions about each other. And we're not, you know, again, pushing together and moving forward together. So we wanted to kind of dispel some negative stereotypes. We wanted to, you know, kind of get more on the wavelength and eventually and come to some sort of solution based. How can we move forward with this? Um, so and then last point, and I'm going to turn it over to Sharice, our facilitator, to help us with introductions and questions and things like that. Um, we went back and forth within the last couple of days as to whether or not we should even host this meeting, because obviously the events that have transpired within the last week have been super duper triggering. Um, and it seemed almost like frivolous, right? Because there's an impending and imminent situation that needs to be dealt with and addressed right now. Um, but I was thinking this morning, maybe yesterday, um, if anybody knows about a dual release capsule, right? Medications, a dual release capsule is something that operates on two levels. There is one reaction that happens immediately and there's one reaction that happens long term. It keeps it gives relief to the person over time. And the thing is that that capsule is taken once and it has these two reactions. So I think in our communities we tend to hyper focus on one situation at a time and when you when you focus on one situation and you look at somebody else who's focusing on something different, there's this mentality that the other person isn't paying attention to what's important you know you're wrong for this and so what i want us to start thinking of ourselves even in terms of our own community is we're dual re we're a dual release community so there's people that need to and should act right now and then there's people that need to and should be preparing for the long term because we're trauma bonded right now we're standing strong right now because we're all feeling the trauma and the effects of what's been going on in our country um, but when everything dies down, when time goes on and emotions die down, where are we going to be? And what are we going to have in place so that we can continue moving forward together, right? So um, that's my plug. I truly, truly hope that everyone here gets something out of this. I'm, I'm personally super excited, like I said, to hear from my colleagues and turn it over to you, Reese. Hey, what's up, everybody? Super excited to be here. Thank you again for extending the invitation to share in this amazing conversation. I think it's long overdue, um, and we are the perfect ones to be having it. Um, just a little disclaimer, we're not here to bash anybody. We're not, you know, especially, you know, academia is a sensitive topic. Um, whether we want to agree with it or not, it is a sensitive topic. But um, I think each of what, each one of us here can attest that um, you know, we didn't wake up one day and decided that we was going to go the route that we went, right? Um, what we've been able to accomplish is directly linked to who it is God has access to be and what and the work he has, has given us to do and will give us to do. So um, we are advocates for education, but we also know that it's not everyone's rights of passage. And we um, stand in agreement in that, you know, everyone is educated on various levels and in various ways. We just happen to come through the academy, amen. So we support everybody, we're not here to bash, we ain't here to be pompous, we ain't here to be, mm -hmm. you know, create this opportunity to just, you know, stroke our egos and flex, not even. We are here to have a dialogue around this divide and why it's even present and what can we do to close it, right? So. I'm here with some amazing friends and I'm, you know, I would do them no justice trying to introduce them, right? No one can talk about me better than I could talk about me, right? Um, but, you know, they are all amazing and I'm just let them go ahead and introduce themselves. We're going to, Jaleesa went already. Um, we're going to start with Cal, then we're going to go just according to what my screen is showing me. We're going to go to Cal, then we're going to go to Shayna, and then we're going to go to Rashad, is that right? That let's I, do I it. I like your, your screen. Your screen is showing the same order my screen is. Come on, alignment. <laughs> got a good screen. But now, nah, in, uh, in uh, just a minute, I'm Kyle Boyer. I grew up in and now live in the suburbs of Philadelphia. I'm an educator, but I'm also a school board member. So I kind of think of education uh, sort of in a 360 way. Uh, I've been blessed to uh, do academic work in education, public administration, and um, also 
theological education. So uh, a few different perspectives, but I'm honored to be here and I'm excited for the conversation. Welcome. Hey everyone, uh, this is Dr. Shana Yutse. I am originally from Brooklyn, New York. I currently reside in Queens. I am an educator and I'm also a uh, licensed preacher. I'm a minister of the gospel as well. So I have a duality here and um, African-American black woman, just definitely trying to make sure that I support the infrastructure for our people. And I'm so excited for everybody that joined with us today. Uh, good evening. Uh, I am so honored to be joining such a cadre of great thinkers. Um, I've known Julissa Barnes since, oh my God, since the second grade almost, Even right? Wow. <laughs> That's true. Uh, my name is Rashad Moore, and I serve as a pastor here in Brooklyn, the First Baptist Church of Crown Heights. I've been there now for about seven months. Mm -hmm. I am a native of Brooklyn, and on the academic side, I am finishing a PhD at Columbia University Teachers College in Philosophy of Education. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad to be here tonight. Awesome, right? So I did all that talking. I never told y'all who I was. Sure didn't. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I am Sharice Wickfall. I am an urban um, educator, emerging scholar, faith leader, um, educated by day. I'm just educated all, all day long, right? Um, faith leader. I am the um, younger Dell pastor, one of the younger Dell pastors at the Greater Allen AME Cathedral of New York. Um, I am educated, you know, I've been got a few degrees. One, you know, will be beginning my final one in the fall and super excited about that. But um, yeah, I am an urban educator. I work with, you know, in non-traditional settings, I help give um, young people first class, second chances. So those, the dropouts and all of those that they put out, I take in and I make sure they make it to the finish line and, and to where it is that they believe they would succeed mostly, whether that be college or the vocational track. Um, I love pastoring my peers and assuring that they are in alignment with their purpose and what it is that God has called them and put them on this earth to be. I love helping them and teaching them how to actualize their faith in society and be all it is that God is calling for us to be. So yeah, that's me, Reese. Good evening. So we got to- Sorry, I want to put in this one last plug real quick. Um, we actually do have um, a great assortment of educators that are actually in our audience as well. So we want to make sure you guys make use of the chat feature. We do have a chat. Um, we're also streaming live on Facebook. Some are sharing the stream. So um, please utilize the chat. If there's something that really catches your ear and you feel strongly about, we want to hear from you as well. So use the chat. Um, and if we have time and if our facilitator says we can, we might even ask to hear from you um, personally. All right, I'm done. <laughs> Great, thank you for that. So I don't have to say that, right? So please utilize the chat. You have questions, they got the raise hand option. I'm gonna try to pay attention to this. I, you know, as brilliant as I think I am, or people think I am, you know, I got a little ADD, so I really can't do much and too many things at one time. So I'm gonna focus on facilitating. Somebody else gonna have to hit the chat, right? Because I got questions I need to ask and all this other stuff. So y'all bear with me, all right? So our first question tonight, let's just get to the matter. There is a divide, right, between uh, men and women and those obtaining degrees, right? There is a divide when it comes to, you know, um, academia and the number of people who are matriculating and, and completing programs, right? There's a divide, right, between men and women, right? Why do we think that, right? And I just feel like, um, and just thinking about when I read the question, I thought, I was just like, you know, it's just, I feel like women just have always led in a lot of areas right for so long right and um i don't know what took us so long to kind of notice that we've been leading in academia but you know again we've been we've been you know everything happens for a reason we are we have been great to address this topic but why do you think the divide is why do you think more women are getting degrees than than men what is the when it comes to education and i know i've had conversations with with gentlemen and it's just like, yo, cause won't you consider, you know, going to school and it's always like, you know, nah, man, you know, and, and it's just like, man, it's a great, you know, it takes discipline. It, it's gonna look good on, on whatever it is. 
you know, it really don't look that good on your resume. Your employer just want to know if you can start something and finish something. But as far as like your development community, right? I was like, school is way more than a degree. The degree is given. You do the work. It's the community. It's the experience. It's being in that space. It's the development, right? That sets you up for other areas. Why do Why do you think there is a divide, right? And since we're talking about women leading, we're going to lead with the brothers in this question, right? Kyle, tell me, why are women leading um, in educational spaces as far as when it comes to obtaining um, degrees? Why do you think women are leading in this? So uh, I'm going to make sure people know I'm not going to try to, for any of these questions, pretend I have all oh, the answers. I'm, or I'm even just glad answer. I'm asking the questions. I don't have to answer them. But <laughs> I will say this. Sometimes I hear you know, well, it starts um, in pre-K. Nah, it starts before that. Mm -hmm. So by the time we get to the end of high school, what we're seeing is 18 years, something 19 even, 19 years of trajectory. Mm -hmm. uh, the health care that their mothers get when um, they're, they are pregnant with them. So there are whole other sociological uh, issues, socioeconomic issues that play into what happens then when we get to pre-K and kindergarten and those early teachers start labeling little Johnny as more threatening or more uh, misbehaving or whatever than little Susie. So all of these things then, by the time we get to the end of high school, what has happened and what's reflected on that high school transcript and the options and the doors that are then presented are a reflection of the 18 years prior. And we, we so often want to go to, you know, high school and try to remedy things then, but the problems really start early on. They start in that pre-K classroom. They start in, in the community with our young kids. And we got to really think about how to set them on a trajectory, our boys in particular, that's going to allow them to access post-secondary um, academia if that's something that they feel called to do. But to not even have the option is in large part a product of that trajectory. Shana, talk to me, sis. Well, I definitely agree. Um, just to dovetail a little bit on that, it's more so as well a conglomeration of what's, what's a trend in the culture. Um, we see in our culture more women obtaining degrees than men uh, because you know, that has been a cultural thread for some reason. And even in society, it's, it's measured that way. You see more women doing that. That's where these statistics are coming from is what's going on in the overall globe. So um, I think what's going on in our society also infiltrates our familial systems and how our family structures are set up and how we nurture and develop uh, children. And um, I think if more push um, more confidence boosting would be given to uh, men just as to women, I think we would see um, a narrowing of that large divide. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a plethora of many variables, your family structure, um, the culture of society, the culture of your household, uh, the legacies that you are birthed into, mm -hmm. um, how uh, mom and dad are raising you, and um, the confidence level. Um, some men that I've met who've um, championed me on, mm -hmm. I also return the favor. And just as you said, and ask, well, when are you coming in to the fold? Mm -hmm. And they'll definitely respond with a lot of reservation. They mm -hmm. will respond with a lot of um, lack of excitement. Mm -hmm. and also not having the confidence to show that they, they are interested. So I think it's a, I think it's a boast of many things that creates this divide between men and women obtaining um, higher ed degrees. Rashad, talk to me. You're muted. Hey, bro. Turn your mic on. Oh, you mute yourself. That's the church, uh, you know, a mute face. So <laughs> two things. One, I think that, um, I want to tackle this two ways. One, I think it's about, Shana just said it, expectation. Mm -hmm. uh, culture is defined by, you know, just your environment. And my up, my kind of development, my academic development has definitely been, been skewed because I went to Morehouse College. 
uh, and I spent four years on an all male campus where it was expected that every black man who walked through there was gonna go on to get a terminal degree. And if you did not get the terminal degree, you were pretty much not, you were the outsider. And so that's one, the level of expectation. But also as you're asking this question, I wondered about all of my friends who I grew up with in Brooklyn and why they didn't go on to get secondary degrees. I think it's also a matter of the economy mm. that uh, if you're looking to make a living and make money right away, mm -hmm. there's no guarantee that once you get a secondary degree that you're actually gonna make money. And so some of these brothers don't go on to get secondary degrees, but they do go on to have successful careers in construction. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have to just be real and honest that a college degree is no longer the passport to, there is no middle class, but whatever we call the middle class, that there is dignity and sometimes more money and actually going into a trade rather than going in just to get a degree for the heck of it. Dope, right? So each of you have touched on society in, um, in your answers, right? I want to ask the question, I'm going to throw this to Jaleesa and Cal. Um, how has society, right, contributed to this divide, right? And what are some of um, the narratives that has been, you know, spoken and just created um, regarding education that has contributed to the divide, right? Because outside of, you know, our family structures and things of that nature and all these um, entities that you all alluded to, as those who pushed and thrust you on, you know, outside of that, there's also a society that is combating, you know what I'm saying, what your home structure is enforcing, what your home structure is encouraging. You know, you get into society and society's like, you don't need all that. You know, you don't need all. So how has um, society contributed to the divide? And what are some narratives that we just have to throw away? Like, that's not the, you know, and how do we um, recreate the, the narrative. So I'm going to throw that to Jaleesa and Kyle. I'm going to go. All right. Um, so first of all, one of the, I, first of all, I feel like there's so many narratives and there's so derivative, so many derivative derivatives of whatever the narratives are. I feel like we don't even really know what we expect of each other or what the expectations of each other are. Um, I do think when people look at, you know, the Black woman as opposed to the black man um as a black woman i feel like there's this expectation that we're supposed to kind of just do everything um you're supposed to be able to have a job you know attract a, a, a man or a spouse you're supposed to attract you know you're supposed to be able to come home cook you know how many people have asked me can i cook and i'm like fam i have two jobs in this patient what do you mean cook can i just eat you know but we're expected to cook and clean and take care of the kids and do whatever and there's just this this narrative that you just you're not supposed to stop like you just keep going and you keep going um and so i think as you know, as a woman, as a black woman, that's been both detrimental and helpful because when times get hard and you have a goal, you have something that you're pushing for, you don't stop. You keep going until you achieve your goal, but it's also very detrimental because then it's like, when do we rest? When do we receive support? Because then if you take, if you take away from any of those structures that are expected, you know, we're expected to kind of uplift the community. We're expected to be advocates and cheerleaders and support systems. If we take any of that away to say, well, I want to um, do something for me. I want to obtain this degree or I want to, you know, pursue this career, or start this business or whatever, then you're selfish. You're, you know what I mean? You're not a team player. You're not a part of, you know, and so I think we don't even know what the expectations are and then because we don't know what the expectations are, they're both too high and not high enough. I don't know how, how else to explain that. Um, and that. And that becomes very tiring and it becomes very exhausting. Um, when you look at black men, and obviously once again, this is glaring from this week, it's almost like y'all are just expected to survive. It's like survive, get a job, and <laughs> survive, get a job, and don't make a whole lot of babies that you can't take care of. And it's, it's like, all right, solid. And so there's, not a lot of expectation, like Rashad said, the expectation isn't there and therefore the intention and the push isn't there. And so we see that manifested um, in this divide, in this gap. 
I would agree. Yeah. I would agree. I think a lot of it is expectation confusion. And um, even though there's expectation confusion, we do have perceptions. There are dominant perceptions. And now um, <laughs> there are so many images being blasted at us. Uh, these devices that are ubiquitous, you know, we see so much. So on the one hand, you know, we, we see the, uh, the pictures pop up of the, the five black lawyers who just graduated law school posing and they, they look fly and they got swag and everything. Um, but I, I, I think the image is there, but, but the work and the, okay, what, what are we going to do with that degree? And, and what, how does it translate to a profession or to, giving back to society. I, I think there's a lot of expectation, confusion, um, even now extending into gender confusion. And, and what, what are their gender roles? What are they? Is that a thing? There's, there's just a lot of confusion. We're changing, we're adapting, but we still have uh, much lower expectations of black males in general. I'm really glad to hear my, my brother over here is a graduate from Morehouse. I'm jealous uh, because when I think of like the, the Mecca of, of black male education and, and pride and confidence, it is definitely a, a Morehouse, but Morehouse is the exception, not the rule, unfortunately. Mm, mm, that's good. Oh, you talked about, um, we talked about, you know, the narrative and you know, the images, right? And when I think about, you know, who was instrumental in, you know, just my desire to pursue higher education from a child, like I knew I was going to college, right? Even after dropping out of high school, I just knew I was going to college. Like, I'm still gonna go to college, it was something. And it was the image of my mother, right? Of me in the back of her classroom, watching her sit in the front of the classroom, get a degree. Right, picking me up from school, picking me and my sister up from school after she done work nine to five to get to the College of New Rochelle for a seven o'clock class, you know what I'm saying? Feeding, giving me dinner on the bus, you know, helping me with homework on the bus. So by the time she gets to the classroom, I could sit in the back, you know, fall asleep if I need to while she grind it out. And I never forget those images. And it's those images that helped push me. But, but imagine, you know, if that, and that's just, you know, how black women are built. We just, these are things that we do, right? Imagine if, and not saying that there are, they weren't black men out there doing that, you know, why aren't their stories being told, right? Who is responsible for you arriving where you are today? What would, who were the images that said this can be done, right? And then the image can be a blessing and a curse because, you know, when you see grind, I never saw my mother pause. Never. There's no pause. Ba 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 ba. We going we gonna get home. I'm gonna tuck you and we gonna do it all over again tomorrow. There's no pause, right? So that grind can be detrimental if you are not taking care of yourself throughout this process, right? So when we talk about you know images and you know a lot of women are always highlighted. How can we replicate the essence of Morehouse? in our communities and, 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 and replicate the essence of Morehouse in community colleges to say, it doesn't matter that you're at LaGuardia, you know, how do we, how does black, how can black men show up in higher ed institutions and replicate their experiences that will help infuse and encourage young people to go to college and continue through, right? So what is the importance of even black men, Shana? Rashad, in higher education, because, you know, Rashad, you come from, as Cal alluded to, the Mecca, like Morehouse man, like you're not expected. You can't tell me you're a Morehouse man and there's no way I will ever perceive you as a bum, ever, <laughs> ever. Not happening. I don't care what you do. I don't care if you left Morehouse and went to sanitation. You will never be a <laughs> bum <laughs> because you've come from it's a lineage of excellence, right? And I think our responsibility is not that we just get these degrees and we go through the experiences. How do we replicate the experience? When we think about those people that have contributed to our success, we didn't just defend, you didn't, I didn't defend yet, but y'all didn't just defend dissertations. Someone was, was um, crucial 
in that process, right? How do we replicate that same support in our spaces when we're trying to, you know, um, enfor not enforce, but, you know, encourage higher ed, you know, in our spaces, right? You all are being higher ed soon with, with all these PhDs, right? How do we say, you know what? I know this is LaGuardia. I know this is um, BMCC, but I'm going to give you the same experience that I, you gonna feel like you went to Morehouse. You gonna feel like you went to Yale. You gonna feel like you came out of Princeton, right here in this community college, right? How important is our presence, black men in particular, in higher education? Shane and Rashad, how important is the presence of black males in higher education? It is extremely important. It is is important to see them in every marketplace structure. Period. Mm -hmm. um, as it relates to education, it's because, as Dr. Barnes mentioned earlier, it is one of the doorways into some of the areas that we see on television, we see in movies, we see on the ticker regarding the stock market. Uh, a male presence is important in the family structure. So to see in education and in the places where you get that training and development, it creates the narrative, right? So further answering that, I'm thinking about the practicality. Yes. Are we showcasing the practicality of education or are yes. we making it a infrastructure that is so hard to obtain and it's so unreachable? Mm -hmm. So we have to think about we that have climbed this mountain, how are we returning or reinvesting in the culture? How yeah. are we going back? Um, and how are we along the way bringing people into our spaces? Now, for me, even though I recently defended last Friday, I can honestly say that I've called every person that I knew was a doctor. I spoke to everybody, um, reached out to people I didn't even know, just let them know, hey, this is the process that I'm undergoing. I just want to know if you could share some advice or information. Mm -hmm. I understand the practicality of being relatable. And I knew to get that information, I had to show myself relatable. And I think for Black men, they need to see the relativity of education. Mm -hmm. They need to see that it's not necessarily gonna be a quick return on the money, but it's necessary for your bag. So when you're thinking about making money, you have to talk about what are the things that help me to make a certain amount of money? Anyone can make money. You could be a hustler, you could, you could do whatever it is. You could sell eyelashes, you could, there are many ways, this is the year and several years of entrepreneurship. Everyone is making money, right? So being that everybody is making money, now you have to delineate it and be specific. What kind of money do you want to make? What mm. price point do you want to be at? Yeah. How much of it and how consistent? Do you look at money as something in your pocket or do you look at money as something that's a return on investment? Looking at it for generational, looking at it for a systemic um, you know, construct breaking. What kind of money do you want to make? Now we have to be specific. Now we have to be intentional. So when you talk about money, practicality, um, the obtainability of it, it has to be relatable. Men need to see the relativity because the way they think, how is this reflective of me? What does this have to do with me? Even when women are talking to men, we can say a mini mountain of things that are very valuable and important, but if it's not practical, they're disengaged. So we have to make sure that we're showing education to be a practical tool and not something that is so far-fetched and hard to obtain. It's very doable. Shot. Uh, that was great. I want to kind of touch on relativity, but I want to focus on an image. So it's not so much about black men need to be in higher ed because there is some magic behind the gate. Mm -hmm. I think it's more so the magnet for me personally, um, was seeing someone that I wanted to emulate, right? So I didn't really want the degree. It wasn't that I was looking to make money for people that I wanted to be like, I went to Morehouse cause I wanted to, I was at I always admire Spike Lee because mm -hmm. he was just so just tell it like it is Calvin Butts up in Harlem, mm -hmm. of course, Martin King, but also Samuel Jackson. These are just, you know, people that you look at and you say, I want to be like them. You know, but they made money. So if they made money. I'm telling you a dead honest truth. I went to Morehouse because I wanted to be a preacher and I knew that Morehouse had this tradition, but I also knew that I, I wanted to be like, I wanted my, my model, my mentor was Calvin Butts. 
So I went to Morehouse because he went to Morehouse. Mm -hmm. I majored in philosophy because he majored in philosophy. I minored in religion because, but my thing is, it wasn't so much that I was looking to make a point and go into college. It's that I saw something that I wanted to be like. That's why the Cosby show was so important. I mean, yes. Cosby later yes. on failed us right. morally, mm -hmm. but it was that image. It was the Cosby show. It was a different world. Yeah. It made the reality that a That's black great. woman could be a lawyer, that you could live in a house and the kids weren't getting beat every day. It gave you an image. So I think when you ask, how do you take the, how do I take what I learned at Morehouse and take it into the world? It's not arrogance, right? I think it's four things. I think it's a high standard that you hold people from, from LaGuardia, Morehouse to No House, you hold them to a high standard right. and you, you give them everything that they need to reach that high standard. But also you're humble enough that you're not looking down on them. You, you're humble enough to reach down to pick them up. And I think that when you think about that standard for who we are as black people, it's always been the church. Many of us went on to college because, or went on to just do well anywhere we went, right? Because of the pulpit, mm -hmm. right? You grew up in a church where the pastor read the report card from the pulpit. I don't think people do that anymore, <laughs> but it made it- they gave me a hundred dollars. Yeah, right. it, it made you like you wanted to do well because you knew that pastor was going to read your report card. And that's something just as simple as that. It told the people that the pastor values education. Now, I respect anybody who decides to go a different route. Mm -hmm. As a pastor, as a black pastor, I, I'm not on a page yet to tell people uh, not to go to college. Mm -hmm. unless unless you have proven that you've got the discipline to and you got a grand idea you got the next facebook idea like you have that discipline if you have that then go but i just i'm not ready yet for the pulpit to be the place that preaches a message not to go to college mm -hmm. and, I, and yeah that's yeah go ahead go ahead no no no. i'm, I'm just because i don't because i also know that that's tough yeah, because there are a lot of people who have gone to college who are in a, a heck of a lot of a lot of debt, and then you got the people you know, eighteen years old. They've been taught to go to college, go to college, go to college, and then it's August before school starts, and people say, "Where the money?" Yeah, you pushed me to go to college, and mm -hmm. I did it. Now where's the money? And so that's another conversation for another day. So I'm just going to end right there. <laughs> Perfect segue, right? So we all, um, Rashad emphasized the the how the church um enforced and encouraged you know academia as it as it was when we were coming up right now that we are of age right i see that there is just education somewhere is just like frowned upon right in certain faith spaces and i've noticed this sometimes it's denominationally sometimes it, it depends on what kind of faith space you're in that will determine you know what I'm saying, the emphasis on academia, right? How have, and I know recently, over, I would say over the past five years for me because I've been paying attention to it, um, you know, how has faith basis contributed to the divide, right? And Rashad, I want you to say more because you was going so you were going somewhere and I feel like, you know, you hit the break and then we'll ask, we'll go with, you know what, I got a question for the girls. We'll go with Cal and Rashad on how has um, faith spaces contributed to this divide. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> I'm trying to really to, speak to you know how faith spaces, churches, pastors have been reacting, you know, to education. Mommy, meet yourself. <laughs> Mute yourself. You know, Pente Pentecost Sunday is coming up. I ain't oh know. I, I ain't know which <laughs> if we were going there, but no. Um, I I think that I really appreciate you uh, you using that phrase faith spaces because even now in some of our denominations they're 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 not even as homogenous as they once were. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> just to pick on my own denomination, a Kojic church in New York is often very different than a Kojic church in. Um, Milwaukee or, or LA or what have you, and not even that far, but faith spaces, 
should really theoretically reflect a lot of aspects of the community in which they are. Now, that's not always the case, um, but I think that there is a certain tie to the community and, and also the society. Many of us are, are familiar with the book, those of us that have done some theological education, um, Christ and Culture. And, you know, we could really wax philosophical about the extent to which the church reflects the culture or is trying to change the culture or is above the culture, et cetera. But in terms of education, I don't think you're going to find a lot of gap between where the members are external of the church and where they are in the faith space. Now, God bless any person who has a, a pastor who is educated and or who even isn't himself or herself educated and is pushing education. Um, but some of our churches are still struggling with pastors and their own <laughs> education struggles. So not all of our pastors, I'm speaking specifically in the black community, not all of our pastors value education the way they should. In fact, not all of our churches model education the way they should. So sometimes some of us have conversations about, okay, well, is there a Sunday school curriculum or is it just, you know, does the spirit just come up with a lesson plan that day? Or do you graduate? Or are you in the same class for 50 years? Are there levels to this thing? If we really, let me, let me end this. If we really want to push the envelope, then we really need to look inside of our faith communities and look at it critically. I think it's better than it was. And to their credit, a lot of our forefathers and a lot of faith spaces worked with what they could work with. Mm -hmm. But there are a whole lot of places where we're doing a disservice to our community by not going beyond this sort of Sunday morning, Sunday school, theological kind of a thing, and really empowering our people to transform society, which means, you know what? I'm not going to be a lawyer from Sunday school. Yes, I can read about Paul and I can learn a little bit about legalism, but I have to actually have to get a JD if I wanna be a lawyer. Um, and that requires pushing people towards the spaces outside of the faith space that are going to equip them to change society. That was a long answer, but I mean, there's, there's a lot there. Yeah, for sure. Wow, yeah, so is that Ishmael Hall? Wow, we went to high school together. I'm so sorry. I'm supposed, supposed to be on this thing. So I wanted to prop, I just want to expand the understanding around education. Mm -hmm. And what is it that we mean when we say education? Is it theological? And my, it doesn't have to be, it does not have to be theological. Mm -hmm. and I think this is a good conversation to have on Pentecost weekend, right? I think the, 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 the wisdom behind Pentecost is that you have to come to a point when we celebrate the gifts of other people. Mm -hmm. We don't have to all speak the same language in order for God to use us. Mm -hmm. And so it's not that I'm pushing everybody to go, if you wanna be in the pulpit, you need to go to seminary. That's right. And I'm, and I'm, not, being, I'm not being arrogant when I say that, that you are really dealing with you know, real issues. But I think whatever gift God gave you, encourage people to go and master whatever it is. If God has called you to do the social media page, then you ought to go somewhere and get some continuing ed yeah. classes in order that you're able to do that well. There are a whole lot of churches, and I hate to say this, that are not going to make it past COVID-19. Because... Because you didn't, you know, there are pastors who thought that they were too old to learn how to use Zoom. Mm -hmm. Or there were churches that thought that they were too old to do online giving. And you realize that we've got to expand. Like, this is, someone said to me the other day, honestly, the churches that are doing well right now are those who have given space for teenagers and young adults to go play around with the, with the stuff in the media room. <laughs> So I think that whatever God, whatever gift God has decided, Dr. King said, if you're going to be a street sweeper, you just be the best street sweeper that there can be. So I'm not saying that you got to go and get a degree and, and go into debt and you're not sure because there are a whole lot of folk who we push to college. And when they get there, they have no idea what they're doing in college. That's not helpful. Mm -hmm. But maybe, maybe God really did call you 
to lead the media ministry at the church and you will make a good living. Mm -hmm. So my whole thing is whatever gift God has given you, master that. Take that talent, don't bury it, don't sit on it, but go and invest in it so that you can be the best street sweeper that there is. That's what the church is for. Yeah. Good answer. Thank you. Thank you for that. Because it's, it's always something that's on our mind. It's like, you know what I'm saying? It's something that irks me when it's just like, you know what I'm saying? You know, you don't need it. You know, you don't need a degree. You just need the Holy Ghost. And I'm just like, no, no. Yeah. I, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I, with I, you. I'm with you, bro. I'm with you. Because I pray to God. I pray because, yeah, you say that. Right. And I'm not I don't know anybody who does this. Yeah. You say that you don't need the Holy Ghost. All you need. You don't need a degree. All you do. All you need is a Holy Ghost. And the only people who go to college are the pastor's kids. Oh. But you, but why, watch this. The people the people who say that don't really believe what they're saying. You don't need a degree. You just need a Holy Ghost. Well, what is the Holy Ghost telling you to do? Are you submitted to the Holy Ghost? Because chances are, so. chances are the Holy Ghost is telling you, take your tail to that <laughs> pool down the street and get equipped for what it is you want. I, I think that's a that's a, 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 a flashpoint for me because the Holy Ghost is intelligent. Brilliant. So that we could have a whole nother, especially on Pentecost Sunday, as my brother said, we could have a whole nother conversation about what Pentecost is really empowering us to do. Right. I, I just got one, I the, got one more the, point. Is the, is Go ahead, Rashad, you can't stir it up. Go. My, what, my one point, <laughs> yeah, that, but no, the well story is true. Notice they, they say that, you know, Bishop Charles Mason, Bishop, founding Bishop of the Church of God in Christ, they said that if he was not at the church praying, he was up in his study reading. He didn't let the members up in his study, mm -hmm. but he was a learned man. Yeah. He's a learned man. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, the Holy Ghost is an activator. It puts you into action. That yeah. is why we come into acts. So you need to be able to think and to perform. And yeah. that's what the Holy Spirit does. And that's why you need to be educated so that you can do it with the spirit of excellence. So you have the spirit. Now you need to make it excellent. What did, what did Paul tell Timothy? Study to show yourself a sure. And before the and before the fire <laughs> fell, they were yes. <laughs> and before the fire <laughs> fell, before the fire fell, they were devoting themselves. Hey, to all the of daily our audience teaching. is not. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, so we don't want to. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We don't want to ostracize anybody. Nah, this is I'm good. I'm sorry, y'all. We, we love y'all. I'm sorry. Aware, hey, we can we can know? look up the study passages in that Quran that I got on my bookshelf too. So. <laughs> about let's talk about let's shift right let's talk about um you know this whole idea of you know what i'm saying if you're in school full time there's so you gotta neglect everything if you're going to school you gotta neglect right you gotta you know do this you can't you know this whole notion that you know if you're in school you know you don't have much time to do nothing and that may be that may be true for some right my, my, my question is for my sisters here right many women feel that they have to choose marriage, family, education, you know what I'm saying? Do you feel like, you know, something has to be given up, right? Do you have to forsake the idea of marriage? Do you have to forsake the idea of relationship? You know, do you have to forsake the idea of pursuing your career and all those things, right? You know, for the sake of a, a degree, right? How do you, now, well, y'all done now. So now that you're done, right, you know, what does, what the, or let me ask you this. How has your, I'm just getting y'all business. How has, what was dating like, you know, through these, these processes, right? Um, yeah, start there. That's the A clause. Start there. What was, what was your relationships like? You know, what was the dating scene like as you would matriculate? First of all, what's dating? Like, <laughs> That was the question. <laughs> no, I mean, you whatever you want to. No, I mean, in, in even in that sense, like, was building a relate? They like that wasn't something that. I don't feel like you have to give it up, but I feel like that's that's been the reality. Um, and I, you know, I'll speak for myself. I, you know, Shane can speak for herself. Um, that's been the reality that you don't have the space to kind of open up enough to allow someone else in to build something. So if you weren't already involved with somebody, I mean, and I, I witnessed this with my peers as well, 
if they weren't already in a relationship or already, you know, kind of attached to somebody, it's very difficult to start something um, when you're immersed in school, especially if you're um, working as well. So my situation was working two jobs and working on a dissertation and trying to be there for family and be there for, you know, church obligations. So there wasn't even really a headspace. I really actually just got back into the headspace of, you know, hey, I'm ready to consider really looking to seriously build something with someone. Um, I don't think you should have to choose, but it's very difficult if you're attached to somebody who doesn't understand what that process takes out of you. Um, so there were even loved ones, we weren't in a romantic relationship, but there was family members and friends that we couldn't stay connected because they, they didn't get it. Um, and my inability to be as available for them um, as they needed, they didn't understand it. And it became a pull um, on both sides. And I got to the point where I said, I'm either going to have to give up what I'm chasing, which is this degree, or we're going to have to cool this, this connection for now because you're not getting it and you're actually hurting me because you're kind of pulling on something that I don't have to give you right now. So I don't think you have to give it up, but you, you know, I don't think you, I don't think it's that you can't have it all, but if you don't have the support around you to kind of hold you up and, and push you and not try to, you know, pull from you as more than you have to give, then that's very difficult. So just listening to you, so you have to choose. Yeah. Yeah. Dana. Oh, Lord, Jesus. <laughs> right, I, do we have to choose between, you know, <laughs> is it oh, one or the other, you know, you know, a doctorate or a boo? Like, or, you know, always got to get the question, though. The women always got to be asked this <laughs> question. Um, I will say honestly and frankly speaking, no, no issues in this area for me. Um, I think the individual has to be very vocal and clear. Look, this is what I'm going to be doing. And, you know, the mutuality is coming up with a plan of action. I didn't just sign up for a doctoral program. I was intentional. I was specific. I said, okay, this is the one I want to do because I have these plans. This is the one that I like because it matches my lifestyle. Um, you don't get involved or engage with anything that's life altering unless it's accommodating to where you're trying to go. Mm -hmm. So I particularly didn't foresee any issues because I had a plan. Um, I talked about my plan and I mapped it out. Um, also, I think it helps when the individual works with someone or is in relationship with someone and they and they're sharing this because it's not something that you just come out of the blue you're, you're discussing this over some time you're mm -hmm. thinking about it it's life altering so um i know some colleagues who told their husbands i want to get a doctorate and they have children and have been married for a couple of years and they're like what you want to go back to school for what like we're good and it's more of that was something they wanted to do for themselves and it was like okay so how are we going to do this and being that I'm not married, I listened to their testimonials and they were specific in saying on weekends, it was my family time. Sundays was really family day. Monday through Friday was work and school. They already had a schedule mapped out. So by the time Saturday had come, they had room to go out on dates, to relax, chill. Sunday, they did family things. But back to Monday through Friday, it was the grind. And I think that helps you to get your degree finished because you have a schedule to adhere to. So you're making sure that you're serving yourself and you're serving your family. But in the instance of dating, you should make a plan. Um, hey, babe, this is what I'm going to be doing. How do you feel about this? Because I'm going to be doing this. And these are the things that I think will be helpful so that I can accomplish this. And then from there, you can build. I don't think it's helpful for anyone to go into something life altering and you not communicate and you not set up a plan or healthy parameters. Mm -hmm. Did you have to choose? No. No, ma'am. No, way. <laughs> no way. Right. So gentlemen, right. How does, you know, and I don't know if either of you are married, but how does, no, I got one note. All right, two no's, right? How does this whole gap when it comes to 
education between men and women? How does it affect relationships, right? How does it affect, um, you know what I'm saying? You're this, when it comes to women, right? You know, does she have to have a degree? Um, you know, that's, you know, if she doesn't come with this, you know, slew of experience and expertise and knowledge and specific, like, is that, uh, you know, is that something you look for? Because I think it has, for me, right? It has been a challenge, you know, coming in and I'm never about, you know, you gotta be on my level. I ain't really about that, right? You just gotta have a level. You have to be somewhere. <laughs> like, you, you, have you have know, you level. don't have to be on <laughs> my level, but you know, man of God, have your feet on it. Man of God, be somewhere. <laughs> Have your feet on the ground, be settled in something, right? You know what I'm saying? Let's have, let's be able to have a conversation. So I'm never on some, you know, because they say we got standards and we do, but so do you. Mm. Y'all have, y'all have standards too. So when it comes to this divide, you know, how has this divide affected, you know, your relationships, you know, with the, with the opposite sex? So um, I'm not, I don't want to be hypocritical, but I just want to just put a pin in that last question to our sisters. So one of the things, so I'm the only black person in my PhD program, and that's not a compliment. It, that, that's just sad, right? But one of the things I did notice about the difference between black PhD students and white students is that white students find all the time in the world like somebody, one of my cohort members, yeah. she's on she's on her second child. We mm -hmm. we the same. So sometimes I think in some ways we glorified the process mm -hmm. just so that we could ignore other areas in our lives. Mm. So I don't want us to sacrifice our joy just for the success. Mm -hmm. And a good book, if sisters are you looking for a good book to read and brothers, is Brittany Cooper. Brittany Cooper has a book titled Eloquent Rage. And she talks about the challenge of, of doing everything that she was taught to do. You're like, you know, leave the guys alone and go to school and get your, your degree. And she's like, I got a doctorate now and I'm still lonely. Mm. So, and my friends who didn't go to college, who didn't go to go to college, they have kids and they seem happier than I am. And I'm the one who did everything that I was supposed to do. It's Eloquent Rage by Brittany Cooper. Um, a woman doesn't have to have a degree but I think the biggest challenge for me is that I get easily bored. Hmm. So it's not about like, I need you to be on my level. It's that I don't want to be bored. And it's like a challenge for me. Oof, Jesus. It's a challenge <laughs> for me to like spend so much of my life working on a project that I'm so invested in to leave that project, to have to spend time talking about something that's so beneath me. Hmm. And so I think what happens is the, the brother will get discouraged. Malcolm X has a video on YouTube and it's talked to, he talks about advice to women. He talks about like, you know, you know, after a brother's been out all day trying to learn, trying to better himself, trying to improve, it's discouraging for him to come home and you have to tell him what you read or saw on The Real Housewives, but it just won't, like personally, my, my, my girlfriend wants me, I'm, she's not watching this, but my girlfriend wants me to watch um, married at first sight. I cannot watch that show. I can't, I, I fall asleep. I cannot do it. It just doesn't appeal to me. Right. But I have, we have to find other ways. I need a conversation partner because I just, I get bored easily. And I think that's the biggest challenge that I see in a relationship. I, I kind of wish that both of the, the fellas on here answering this question were not preachers because there are some ways that our perspective is a little bit skewed. Uh, preachers are, are public in a host of different ways. So in addition to the school, there's always this, this calling to just be in stuff. But I say that to say, um, if I, upon reflection, I've done a lot of reflection <laughs> about relationships because I'm, I'm still technically single at the moment. Um, you know, you make choices and there are times when you choose to be involved in stuff and you choose to put your focus and the energy and, and you, there are times, most of us can probably say where we've casually dated knowing full well, we were not invested in, 
in building something. Sometimes people just want company. Uh, these are all things that people don't want to admit about dating and, and young adulthood or adulthood, but, but it's realities. Everybody approaches whoever they're, they're dating for different reasons. Um, I, I think looking back on all of the schooling that I've done, there are a host of people of all races, of all sexual orientations who were in relationships. And, and I was amazed. I would always be amazed. Like, where y'all meet at? Where, where is, what, what, right. what social God. gathering or, you know, <laughs> not that we were there as the preachers doing whatever, but what happy hour were y'all at where y'all all got together and y'all all married with children and babies and, and blah, blah, blah. It's possible, but a lot of it comes down to the, the decisions that we, we make. And I appreciate what Rashad was saying. Um, sometimes we use any number of things to justify uh, the, the decisions that we make. But I think it's important for people going to any program to just be honest. Like, what, what do I want? Mm -hmm. The same way that Shante was talking about, she knew what her goals were after that. Well, do I, do I simultaneously want to be in a relationship now? Because if I do while I'm in school, then I'll make space for that. I'll be looking around class being like, oh, turns out, you know, yeah. Sister Susie is single too. Hey, we Cole. do the same thing again in, in the church context. You know, some people are there just to, to, to worship and other people are there to worship and. So before you go to whatever program you do, sit down and reflect and, and think about what it is that you want to want to get out of it. And then also think about your capacity to get that because it may be that, that you don't have the capacity for a relationship with it. You haven't made the capacity. And upon reflection, as I end, that was a lot of the time why I wasn't in certain relationships or why looking back on it, some of the people I dated are married with kids now because <laughs> I wasn't in that space. You know what I mean? That's my testimony. Coulda, shoulda, woulda, but didn't. Didn't. Can I get a 30 second rebuttal, Go ahead. please? So something that I, I, I want to be careful of moving forward, and I don't, I do want to be careful of, and that is, and I'm not going to go into the whole church thing, because I know we got people who are not in church, but I also think that in our, if you've grown up in church, in some ways that we are not aware of, we have interpreted being single as a sign of faithfulness. Mm not faithfulness to ourselves, but faithfulness to the project or to the institution. Mm -hmm. there, there would, honestly, y'all think about it. And I know if I'm saying this, I'm leaving it alone. Like out of many of the churches that I've served, those churches would crumble to the ground had it not been for single people who can stay all night and come early Sunday and they get married to the, the project of the church. And it, it gets interpreted as faithfulness. Like you are that, because I'm not committed. And, and what happens at the end of the day is that you've given your all to something only to go home and not be happy. Be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important. And it's just like, even as I, think about what my process will look like. Like I am determined not to deprive myself of, you know, and I've, I'm one who's very disciplined. I do what I need to do when I have to do it, but I've refused to deprive myself of a social life of, you know what I'm saying, relationships, um, being in community because, mm. you know what I'm saying? We isolate ourselves, you know, for three to four to five years and then we come out and focus, you know, yay, I'm done. What's up? It's lit. And they like, child, we don't, we can't, we. But, but real quick, I said one thing, just, just real quick. The wave. But, but that, that social life, right? You, you see the social life and dating are kind of, they ain't one and the same. Cause you can have a social life. Social life doesn't necessarily imply commitment. Yeah. Right. Social life just implies catching an Uber to the, to the social gathering. Mm -hmm. Dating implies even at the lowest level, a certain level of, well, commitment and vulnerability mm -hmm. um, and flexibility. So they, they, I'm not, and I'm not rebutting you cause I agree with you, yeah. but looking back on it, like I, I, I've always had a great social life. I have to, for my own mental health, I have exactly. to be around people. Right. Uh, even now, you know, I listen, 
full disclosure, I've, I've still made space and time for my friends, but dating is a completely different element of social. And I just want to put in this plug, going back to what Shana said about practicality. So when we talk about, you know, encouraging young people and youth to pursue higher education, and you're talking about practicality, talk about that timeline and talk about what those expectations are. So part of my experience is that I went straight through. There was not a time since kindergarten that I was not on somebody's um, class list as a student. So you go from high school to college to grad school, j then just into the you know workforce and still you know trying to get this final degree, this final step. So the time that you develop those relationships and the time that you kind of make those choices now at 30 more than 30 um I just had a birthday um now at this stage now you're a fully actualized realized adult and now you can kind of look back and say okay you know this was this is where you could have given a little bit more that's where you could have given but we know that young people younger people tend to think more in extremes it's like i need to do this i need to get this i need to do this right now so even when we're reaching back into the next generation and we're saying okay when you map out your life like shana said what are the things that you're considering so maybe you don't want to go straight from your master's into getting a doctorate because you want to take some time to establish you know what i mean a different area of your life and then you know, go back so that you can make room and fit things in. So, you know, speaking for myself, for about 10 years, I was hyper transient. I literally just moved from space to space every single year. I was living somewhere different. I was, you know, going somewhere different. So understand, you know, at 18 years old, 22 years old, you don't necessarily consider the toll that that takes, that emotional toll, the financial toll, and then you get to your late 20s and 30s and it's like, okay, well, hold up. Something has to give and something can give and you can make room. So just wanted to put that plug in make sure we're considering that when we talk to our kids about, you know, pursuing something higher. So let me ask this, is there a difference? And I'm gonna let you answer, Shannon, because we have some, some to say. So you say what you have to say and then answer. Is there a difference, right? So I heard various perspectives as it relates to balancing and all this thing. Is there a difference between how women balance, you know, school, work, and other obligations than there is with men, right? Is there a difference between how we how we balance and our approach to balancing all those things, right? Shayna, and let's ask Rashad. I think that it is a difference. Some um, perceive women to be really great at managing, you know, house management, family management, things of that nature. Um, naturally, statistically, is, is it expected? Is it expected? It is perceived to be that way. So that's why I think it is is expected more for the woman to do the juggle. But if you're in a relationship, then there should be a mutuality there, a partnership, right? So there should be a balance. If you're not in a relationship, then it depends on the person's, you know, skill and ability, you know, aptitude. Are they communicating. I wanted to say prior to this question, the thread here in our community as African Americans is communicating. Mm -hmm. Are we sharing? Are Black men open to sharing? Are they, are they telling what they need? Mm -hmm. Are they being honest about what is going to help um, in their pursuit, pursuit of happiness, pursuit of life? So you talk about balancing, you know, women, should be vocal and say what they need and help with. You can't do it all. Do you have someone you can call? Do you have someone you can speak to? Be honest with yourself and communicate that. I think for men, uh, being vocal is not really supported for them. They're mm -hmm. really um, encouraged to not speak, if anything, or they're not encouraged to ask for help because there's this narrative of black strong men, right? So I think more so it can be an even balance juggling act, but because of the narratives that women are expected to do everything, yeah. it is that women balance and juggle more. But I think if we both communicate, it can work. Mm -hmm. Rashad, what's the difference? How does, how does men do it? How do men do it? You're muted, man. Say that, can you repeat the question? How do we do what? It was just, I was just inquiring about the difference as it relates to managing it all, right? You know, 
if dating is an option while pursuing you know education and other obligations right we're not just in school we're going to work you know what i'm mm -hmm. saying we're pastoring we're leading in other capacities when it comes to balancing it all you know is there a different of course there's a difference right you know is there an expectation for you to balance it you know mm, got it and you say you know what i'm gonna take this off my plate and not do it and i'm just gonna do this right and i feel like sometimes woman as Shane alluded to, we just expected to do it all. What's, how do you, how was, how are men perceived to balance it all? I, I'm probably not the right person to ask, right? Only because my entire like life after college has been between school and church full time. And so I'm just used to, I'm expected to do it all and to do it well. And I would just honestly say that in some ways I've done it all. And what's suffered the most are probably those who are closest to me, mm. which is, yeah. And I think women are expected to like do it all and everybody's different, right? Some women are expected to do it all and still take care of children. If you're not taking care of children, you're taking care of your parents. When men don't have that, right? You don't have to go and take care of your grandfather. My grandfather just died in March, but out of all the grandkids, I was never asked to stay with him, right? And it was just expected that I was out, I was busy. And so I never had to really take care of like home responsibilities. And that might be the difference. I'm, Kyle, I'm, say something. I'm gonna challenge I am on mute. I'm going to challenge the premise. I, I really don't believe anybody can or does it all. I, I just don't. And that's, that's true. Um, all of us have limited capacity, period. Yeah. So is it possible for us to manage our responsibilities? Yes. But I don't I don't consider that doing it all. We, we do you know, what we need to do, get stuff done. If you try to do it all at a certain point, something, when you look back on it and you assess, something was lacking, right? The old adage, jack of all trades, master of none. So um, in, in a lot of cases for black males expected to do it all and can't, a lot of times the additional expectation, no, we don't, we don't bear children. So often that's not necessarily the responsibility. Oftentimes it's the additional pressures that society puts on us. So to have to wear that pressure and to have to project and to have to, you know, control emotion and not be the angry black male and stay alive in the case of police stuff. There, it's the additional pressures and many of us don't even manage that well. So conversation among a lot of my preacher friends and I is about the need for us to destigmatize um, seeing therapists and stuff of that nature. Uh, you know, I, no, nobody does does everything. Nobody does it all. I agree. Nobody does it all. But um, I think the premise is that there is there's more outward expectation toward women. And I like the point that you just touched on, Kyle. There's more of an outward expectation and there's more of an internal battle going on in the black man. So like um, when Sharice was introducing herself earlier and she mentioned, she might as well have been telling my story because that literally was my mother getting up early in the morning, getting herself together so she could get me and my sister ready for school, taking us to school, going to her job, then dropping us off at family members or arranging for family members to pick us up from school so that she could go to her night class and then pick us up, take us back home, do dinner, look over homework, make sure it was done and that it was done right. Cause if you didn't do it right, then you gotta do it over. I'm sitting with us while we're doing that, while we're battling with that, getting us ready for bed, get in the bed. And then that was her time. And then wake up the next morning and do it over again. And I come from a two parent household and where was my, he was at work. My dad was at work. Um, and so the, the perception is that, and he, and he's a good provider. So no shade to my dad at all. I love him. He did everything that, you know, he felt he needed to do, but there was a very clear distinction between what mom does and what dad does that we can see that's active. Um, but I don't want to undermine exactly what you said. This, this, the concept that black men have to stay alive and how much, like you said, the, the pressure and the emotional and even physical toll um, that that takes. Um, I was actually having a conversation with a few of my, you know, male friends and male cousins at different times, at different um, 
places in life that didn't even know each other. And one of the things that struck me was this sense that they all told me that at some point they feel like they have to physically try to shrink themselves so that they don't perceive, they're not perceived to be too intimidating to the people around them. And that's not something that I have to really consider to, fit, to feel like you have to physically you know, push yourself down so somebody doesn't see you as a threat and doesn't, you know, target you and come. So I don't want to undermine that. So I think, again, like we have to have these kinds of conversations because the pressures are there for both sides, but one is much more external and one is much more. So one we see more and the other we don't really see, but it needs to be discussed more so we know how to support that side as well. I think everybody on each side is saying, I need more support, I need more grace, I need more patience, um, but we don't know how to give it because we're both so caught up in what we're dealing with or what we feel our, the expectations on us are. Thank you, Dr. Barnes. So we're wrapping up, right? And I don't know if we have any questions in the comment section, you could, are there? We do? I told y'all I got ADD, I wanted to go catch him. Right. But I want us to start thinking as we close down, they had a closing question, but I really going to deviate from it a little bit. I want us to think about the time that we're currently in. I want us to really figure out how we can individually, collectively, right, um, respond, you know, and I know it's, and when I say prophetically, I'm not talking churchy. I'm not talking that, right? How can we utilize all of the information that we've obtained? How can we utilize our, our status and position in society to respond to what is happening in Black America today? How can we use, utilize our scholarship? How can we utilize you know, our position, our influence, our intellect to respond to what is happening in society today because right now it don't matter that we smart mm -hmm. it don't matter that you got bars on your your shoulder it don't matter right someone can still kneel in your neck and take your life mm -hmm. how do we respond to what is happening because that's that's another divide mm -hmm. that yeah. just has to everyone has differing views of how to respond everyone has right at the what i'm pushing is you know, everybody is not going to respond in the same way. And I've been wrestling all day with not supposed to. how are you going to respond? What is my response going to be? Because it's not going to look like, you know, everyone else, right? But how, what is, what is my, what is my, and we can make suggestions. We can, I'm not asking you to answer it. I'm asking you to think about it. What is our response going to be to this? Because some, some, something needs to not just be said, mm -hmm. something needs to be done. Yeah, I agree. I think something needs to be said, but it shouldn't be um, a part of the divide. Mm -hmm. so, um, mm -hmm. We're not adding to the divide. No, right? no. I think a lot of the combat um, that we've been More separation has been contributing. Is that your hand up, Rashad? I was fixing my life. I got something oh, to say, but that was my life. I'm sorry. No, we don't want to widen the divide because I think sometimes our approaches, you know, just wanting to be right can widen the divide. We don't just want to be right. We don't just want to sound good. We don't just want to just, you know, be somewhere for a photo op. I want to say that, uh, as Jaleesa said, earlier today about the pill and it has that that dual something uh, it was real fancy you know, it don't all come out at you yeah, don't always come out at the same time that's also a distinction between reaction and response mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i i think that burning down i don't think black people burned that precinct down last night i know black people didn't burn that precinct down last night that was an undercover cop who was enticing that mm -hmm. so that wasn't black people because mm -hmm. we went you know we church like going to be out there you burn down no precinct so a part of it is reaction and the other yes. part of it is a response and i think rage is a reaction i think response is long term mm -hmm. and this may not this may not mm -hmm. hit anybody um a part of my like doctoral work is on rituals and historically black education mm 
And I'm really interested in finding the ways in which rituals shape an institution. Mm. Today, I thought about, I started thinking about all of the professors who were teaching at Morehouse during the 40s. Mm. King graduated from Morehouse in 1948. And I thought about all of those professors who were teaching day in and day out. And they just had no idea that they were teaching Martin Luther King. Mm. And a part, and I know that doesn't sound like it connects, but I found today, I was like, you know, waking up every day and teaching is a form of protest. Mm -hmm. Like if like you don't realize what you're doing, like you may never, you may not live to see what that child will become, but that is like a part of protesting, y'all is just committing to the work that God has called you to do. And it's a radical thing. Mm -hmm. Like keeping the doors of the church open yes, is sir. a radical thing. Yes, sir. Like the, the people say, where the church at? Why the church not in the street? Like the fact that we're able to pay for somebody's funeral when they go out there and get killed mm -hmm. and we can help the family. Like that is a part of the response. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, I, that doesn't sound... It doesn't sound deep, but I I'm like, y'all, we it. in the middle of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. Like we can't all go out in the street and get sick. Right. So that's not a, like, that's not an option. We can't go burn down the White House. Like that's at the end of the day, but there's some teacher in the middle of Brownsville mm -hmm. who still got her kids on mm -hmm. that Zoom call next week. Yeah. And 20 years from now, that child gonna change the world. I feel like that's, that's I'll pour out my spirit mm -hmm. on, I'm not, I'm gonna be churchy. But I think that that like that everydayness is a form of protest. Thank you, thank you for that. And we do have a comment from Freddy Fernandez. He says the greatest form of response is to teach the lessons taught, mentoring, and passing down history. Yes. Christiane yes. Gilmore says that she's creating a mutual aid network for Black men, especially those who were fully incarcerated. She did put her contact information. Um, we'll download, we'll um, download this um, chat transcript and mm -hmm. um, dis dis distribute that to those who want it. Mm -hmm. um, I'll go next and let, uh, let the, the ladies have the last say. Um, I agree completely with what my brother said. I was actually gonna mention prophetic acts. And again, you know, not the, not the deep churchy prophetic, but more the, the Walter Brueggemann kind of prophetic. Um, being prophetic is also in our actions, just mm -hmm. like Rashad was saying. And this, while it may not be action in the traditional sense, to really parse through issues and, and to wade into nuance. Um, the culture doesn't like nuance because you gotta, you gotta wrestle to get to nuance, but to wade through nuance, that's action. To, um, to do, all of us in our separate stations are doing prophetic things. So I got my pastor over here. Even obtaining that PhD can be prophetic. Perse persevering in spite of um, the, the, the bias in the education system, K-12 and, and higher education. So um, it's in our actions. It's tweets don't change things. Mm -hmm. Tweets don't change things. Facebook posts, as eloquent as some of us think we are, don't change things. It's on the ground, though. It's those those actions that are off of social media that are really making moves. It's the, the policy decisions in those rooms when some of us are talking to political leaders. Um, all of those things, action. We'll go with Shayna and then let Jaleesa close. I'm going to go next because I want Shayna to, you know, send us home. Well, you know, Sharice is going to send us home, but Shayna can send us home in this discussion. Okay. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I want to allude to, I 100% agree with what both my brothers just said. Um, Rashad mentioned something earlier about, you know, how the Cosby show in a different world, you know, changed so many people's perceptions of what Black people could be. Um, representation matters. Um, for those of you who missed the beginning of this talk, I mentioned that the, the gap widened back in the 70s. So this gap is not new. Um, to our culture, we're just talking about it because actually it began to close in the early 2000s. And that was when we, in this age group, we were the ones who were obtaining these degrees. So we're the, so that is a reflection of us in our upbringing. And one thing that I can remember very clearly, and I'm so super happy that I grew up in the generation that I grew up in was representation was 
everywhere and it was everything. It was in our classrooms. It was on TV. It was on the radio. All of my heroes were black. We had a black Cinderella, Brandy, and she was Moesha. You know what I mean? So she could get down and she could go to the, the Prince Charming's ball. You know what I mean? You had Maxine Shaw, attorney at law. I was getting myself together and I was, you know, I wanted to be Maxine Shaw, attorney at law. You know what I mean? We talked about at home I was talking to somebody the other day, like every Black History Month, and you know, that's when we had network TV and streaming wasn't a thing, but every Black History Month, every weekend, we're watching, we're watching Roots, we're watching Summer Down Summer, we're, and we're talking about it. So there was dialogue in my household, there was dialogue when I left my household, like Rashad said, you went to church, there was dialogue there. I remember the little, remember the little kente cloth things were in everything. You had the kente cloth stole, and the little hat, and the, I mean, but, it, and it was everything, and it was everywhere and I went to a high school where we were empowered to celebrate our blackness so we had teachers that code switch the importance of um, uplifting kids in the in the concept of code switching that you're not dumb for speaking slang but know when to turn it on and when to turn it off so to have your English teacher be able to walk in the classroom and be like y'all be like and then switch it right off and be able to speak the king's english like whatever so representation matters telling and retelling the stories matter history matters teaching our kids that they're they're not isolated I know we want to act like we live in this post-racial, well, you know, they want to act like they live in this post-racial society, and in many ways, we let them. Um, don't let them think that. You are Black, but let's own that. Let's be proud of that, but understand that that means something different for you, and it doesn't have to mean something negative, but it's something different. It's something that's unique, and it's something to be celebrated and to help propel us and push us so we keep going together. Yeah. Dr. Ruth say. Send us home. Uh, yeah, I just found out I'm sending us home. So <laughs> um, in response to the question, in my honest of humble hearts, uh, what we can do that can help in this current time and moving forward um, is to create infrastructure. And I know right now emotions are very high and it's hard to teach structure when you're in rage, when you're angry. And so I think to help resonate once the emotions get to a balance or back to an equilibrium, we can create infrastructures that promote mental health, physical health, spiritual health, um, all kinds of practical skill sets that make up human development. That's something that the black community has to start paying attention to infrastructuring things that allow us to be meaning making individuals in the marketplace. So whatever, whatever economy of society you're in, whether you are a preacher, whether you're a health professional, whether you're in academia, whether you are whatever it is, create a structure in that space that welcomes the empowerment and the betterment for black people, because that's how you get representation. You will not see representation if you have not been invited to the table. So for those of you that are gatekeepers in those specific areas, make sure that you're making a pathway that is sustainable. Make sure you teach, make sure you provide workshops, provide data, that's very important. Show the statistics, show the information. Um, church institutions, start making your palette more palpable for the marketplace. Are you creating spaces where folks can get jobs? After this pandemic, how many of the congregants are gonna have employment? Um, how are you connecting with those that are in your legislation? Um, how are you politicized, not necessarily politicizing, but how are you making sure that you have a political undertone? Because this is a political thing. So making sure that you're creating infrastructures in the marketplace for us, for our people. Um, family care, family service, some of us may have to go back to work, but the schools are closed. So how are the churches and community centers and services available so that our people can go back to work? So we need to create infrastructure for each other, make sure we're serving each other. That's how we have representation. That's how we control our own narrative. That's how we create what we know we are. When we put out there the knowledge of self, then the government can tell us who we are. 
then they can't mess up or obscure who we are because we bring that to the table. And we also have to protect each other. I think it's important to also pull from um, some of the tenets of the Nation of Islam where they talk about how if the family structure is strong, then that's when we will be strong in the marketplace. So when we start valuing our brothers, our sisters, our aunties, our uncles, our children, when we start valuing each other, I think our marketplace structures will become even greater. Um, when we do these kinds of acts, in my honest opinion, I think that's when we are more unified and I think it will make a lasting legacy so that we're not looking to get an answer from someone that never gave us an answer. So that we're not looking for help from someone that never destined to help us. So the infrastructure that is in place is not for us. So we have to make our own. So I'm charging everybody that's listening Wherever you are a gatekeeper, make a space to bring us in and make a space that we can be fortified to continue the legacy of that space. If you have real estate, do not sell your property. Keep it within your family. Make sure that those who are in your community can buy the property possibly. Keep it within our own infrastructure. We don't have one right now. And that's why we are burning down places and spaces and homes because it doesn't belong to us. When something belongs to you, you handle it with care and you make sure it never dies. So I really in charge, I charge everyone to think like this um, from today on. Are you creating infrastructure? Are you creating a door? Um, who are you bringing in and how are you sustaining that? Thank you, thank you. Again, thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you to Jaleesa and all of those who um, you know, came up with this idea to have this dialogue. I think it's timely. Um, I think we were able to unpack and bring clarity to some issues um, that, you know, sometimes just get swept under the rug and go un um, under notice. So thank you for your expertise. Thank you for, you know, your just intellectual contributions to the conversation. Um, you know, look at the dialogue or something else um, and unpack something else. Again, thank you all. Um, Jaleesa, I don't know what's happening right now. It is 941. I don't yeah, know. It's 941. I just wanted to give, yeah, we're, 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 we're done. You said everything I wanted to say. I, okay. I'm, my heart is so full. Um, I'm so just happy and pleased with this outcome. Everybody who is a part of the audience, both on Zoom and on Facebook, um, this panel and and facilitator was just dynamic i do believe it was god ordained that to put this group of people together because this was just awesome and amazing and i'm so happy um if you have a, a program an initiative something that's already in place something that you're looking to push or um you know even if you're Speaking something else, please just drop it in the chat, um, drop your contact information, because once again, we do want to build together. And it's one thing to talk about it, it's another thing to be about it. So if there is something that's concrete um, that you have in place or are even preparing to put in place and you want the support of your community, please just drop this in the chat. We'll leave it open for another three to five minutes just so you can do that real quick. Um, like Christiane, she just repeated, she's recreating a business to um, teach skills to black men who have been incarcerated. And that's another conversation. And that's another thing I do hope that this is the first of multiple, this isn't the end. This is just unpacking. This is just the beginning. This is the first, um, I won't even say surface because I do think we went kind of deep today, um, but we definitely want to have more conversations like this because this is how we build. This is how we understand each other. This is how we support one another. Kyle Boyer, if you are in the Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, please just take a second, Kyle, and talk about your um, campaign. And I just know you're running for, for something. Talk about what you're running for, what you're, you know, put in that last plug. I believe um, election day is June 2nd out in Pennsylvania. So go ahead and do that real quick while. Sure, thank you. Yeah. And I'm just, man, I'm honored and uh, encouraged by this, by this panel. Everybody's doing awesome things. Uh, I'm running for state Senate. I currently serve on a school board running for state Senate in the 19th district um, in Pennsylvania for Pennsylvania state legislature. The Pennsylvania primary is in four days, three days and a couple hours on June 2nd. And I'm in a competitive uh, primary, Democratic primary with two other individuals. So 
Uh, most of you probably do not live in Pennsylvania from what I've seen, but if you do and you're in the 19th district, I certainly encourage you to vote for me. Otherwise, uh, I solicit your prayers. And if I win and go on to the general, y'all y'all go to KyleJBoyer.com and y'all donate, make a contribution. But nah, seriously, I'm honored to have been on this panel and hopefully making some connections with some of my fellow panelists. Absolutely. Preachers, Pentecostal. All right, so once again, thank you, everyone. <laughs> you know me getting deep. Uh, so once again, thank you, everyone. If anybody is looking to protest, there is one that is being organized. There are several that are being organized in New York City. I will be gathering at Boys and Girls High School in Brooklyn tomorrow at 3 p.m. If anybody wants to join me, if not, please find one. If you're interested, please find one in your local area because we do want to be on the street. We're not just about talk. We're about action. Um, please go out, show your show your support to our Black men. We love our Black men. We support you. We value you. Your life matters. If the whole world tells you your life don't matter, your life matters to us. So I wanted to say that publicly and plainly, you're safe with us. And we love you, we support you, and we value you. All right? Everybody, have a great, great night. And once again, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Safe. Blessings to everybody. Right, right. Good night. How do I end this? Hold on. Okay, there you go. <laughs>